Hello and welcome to the webinar. We'll get started here in a second. I'm looking at the screen and watching everyone come into the webinar, so we'll give everyone a moment to come in. Some people's connection speeds a little takes a little longer than others. Okay. So, um, well, welcome to the webinar. My name is Josh McDaniel. I work with the Wildland Fire Lessons Learn Center, editing and writing for the Lessons Learn Center's website, Advances in Fire Practice. I'll be introducing the speaker in a minute and moderating the question and answer session after the presentation. Uh, but first, I wanted to make a couple quick announcements um, just about upcoming webinars um, and a couple of little notes here. Um, the, the webinar is sponsored by three different organizations. There's the Wildland Fire Lessons Learn Center, the International Association of Wildland Fire, let me get my slide up there, and the Joint Fire Science Program. Um, I've put up some plugs for the for the organizations and their websites here, and I really want to invite you to check out some of the growing amount of resources in Wildland Fire and Wildland Fire Science and Management on on all three of these websites. Um, there's a lot to explore there, so I really encourage you to check it out. Um, next, I wanted to let you know a little bit about some the upcoming webinars. And right now, the only one that is um, uh, completely confirmed is Jim Sablin is going to be presenting the next web webinar on October 25th on human and organizational performance, folklore, and science. Um, I believe Molly Hunter is going to be presenting in November on um, the fires formerly known as fire use on the Gila National Forest, but we haven't got an official title on that yet, but I'll be posting that pretty soon. And you can register for all the webinars on the Advances in Fire Practice webpage. There's the link, and I know that's a little clunky, so if you can just use your search engine to find Advances in Fire Practice, that'll take you to the, to the place right at the top there, and you can um, click on the webinars to register or view past webinars as well. Um, so, now on, today, on to today's webinar. I'll introduce uh, the speaker in just a second, but I want to let you know how questions work. If you have a question, and you can type these in at any time, and we encourage you to get the questions in early, there's a box on your control panel. It should be named either questions or chat. And you can type in your question there. And at the end of the presentation, we'll go through those and read them out. And then uh, Peter Brown will respond to those uh, in the time that we have. We usually we try to get through all the questions if we can. Usually we're able to. If not, we can respond by email. Also, the, the webinar is recorded and it's archived, so it's there permanently. Um, we leave it up on the Advances in Fire Practice page for a few days, and then it's archived on the Frames website. And there's links on the Advances in Fire Practice page there, and then also you can navigate to it on the Frames website as well. But um, you should be able to, to, if you have any troubles, give me a, a, send me an email, and I'll, I'll put my email up in a little bit. And I, usually there's quite a bit, of, quite a strong amount of requests for, for the recordings. Okay, so that should take care of the housekeeping. So I'll go ahead and uh, introduce the, the presenter for today. Uh, Peter Brown is going to be speaking, and he is the director of the nonprofit Rocky Mountain Tree Ring Research Group out of Fort Collins, Colorado. He uh, founded the, organ the organization in 1997 after completing his, his uh, graduate work with Tom Swetnam at the University of Arizona and also his PhD at Colorado State University. He also mentioned to me that prior to that he was involved in a, he was a professional scuba diver in Monterey, California, <laughs> but that's not really relevant now. Um, Peter has gone on to become one of the leading tree ring, tree ring researchers in the world, and today we have close to 300 people registered for this webinar, and I think that's a testament to the strength of, of, of Peter's research and, and some of the just the, the knowledge that he has brought to the subject of fire history and climate in the past. So um, I think it's also a testament to the intriguing title he put on there, because I've had lots of questions about pyro, pyrogeography over email for the last week or so um, leading up to the webinar. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to Peter now, and he can explain uh, what uh, pyrogeography is and let us in on some of his latest research. Go ahead, Peter. Well, thank you, Josh, and thank you for the introduction. Um, I thought you were going to mention that about the, the professional diving. <laughs> anyway, well, so yeah, in terms of pyrogeography, and, and notice I changed the title a little bit there, how climate has affected fire regimes and fire history across 
western U.S. And, and where we may be going in the future. Thinking about uh, pyrogeography both in terms of how fire regimes, the average of fire frequency behavior and so on, varies across geographic scales, landscapes and, and uh, elevation gradients and latitudinal gradients and so on, but then also how fire history is varied both across space and then through time. So that's what uh, I'll try and cover a bit today. So, so an outline for today's talk, uh, what I want to do first of all is just really kind of, uh, so we're, our, we're, this is going to describe two JFSVP funded projects. Uh, the Fire History and Climate Change Project, and then the Fire and Climate Synthesis Project uh, that I'm going to be, uh, that I've been a part of. And then uh, both of these are sort of uh, talking about differences between fire regime and, and fire history, uh, synthesizing what we know about fire regimes across, in fact, the entire U.S., and then also the fire history in the Western U.S., particularly as it relates to fire climatology. Well, first of all, I just want to point out the difference between fire weather and fire climate. Probably, I would imagine most everybody on this talk is looking at, you know, differences between weather and climate, but just to, to make that distinction as we go through the, the rest of the talk here. Uh, I want to make some points finally about future climate change and where we may be headed in the, uh, with, with fire in particular. And then the uh, last couple of slides will just be contact information for the projects discussed and what's coming next. So uh, if you have any other further questions about that. So first of all, just climate versus weather. And I've always liked this quote, weather tells you what to wear today, but climate tells you what clothes to buy. Essentially what we're dealing with is climate, it, um, climate are the bounds, the envelope of possibilities within which weather bounces around. Uh, weather, of course, is chaotic. Uh, we can't predict the weather more than about a week or so in advance because it depends very sensitively on the evolution of the system from one moment to the next. On the other hand, climate is really determined by the properties of the Earth system itself. And the increasingly, particularly thinking about global climate change and, and future warming, uh, obviously we're uh, the, we're understanding those properties more and more, and we're being able to really uh, understand where climate is going in terms of, of you know, properties of the oceans, properties of the atmosphere, properties of the ecosystems, uh, the terrestrial systems, properties of the ice, uh, and so on. Uh, now, one thing is this leads to that last point there. This leads to strong predictability. Strong there are strong limits to the predictability of weather because the initial conditions are constantly changing. But since the boundary conditions are increasingly well understood and also increasingly well modeled by global climate models, models uh, the climate changes uh, are somewhat, either very to somewhat predictable into the future. I mean. Uh, you know, the, the point on climate is we know with great certainty that January is going to be colder than July. That's because, of the, again, the properties of the Earth system. Uh, but obviously that no one can tell you exactly how cold it's going to be in July or, or in January. And certainly we can have cold weather. This is where weather comes into play. We can certainly have cold weather in July, that, uh, but in general, most years, January is going to be colder than July, at least in the Northern Hemisphere. So one thing that I really liked was this, in terms of just conceptualizing the difference between fire weather and fire climate, was this uh, figure from Max Moritz and, and others' paper in 2005, but just where they, they kind of put this all together with what fire managers are very familiar with in terms of you know, here's the fire triangle that operates, you know, at the scale of, on a, on a single piece of fuel and the scale of seconds and, and over very small scales. We have to have oxygen, some sort of heat source and fuel, obviously, for fire to occur. Now, if we scale up, then we get the fire behavior triangle. So now we're starting to throw in, uh, we still have fuel in the equation, but we're starting to throw in weather and topography as other factors that control fire behavior. And, and this is any one individual fire uh, burning over days, hours to days to weeks, uh, and over you know fairly small scales, although increasingly larger scales uh, coming up. 
So here we have weather that's controlling fire behavior, uh, both fire occurrence and fire behavior over these shorter time scales and smaller spatial scales. And then we can scale up even longer to where climate now comes into play, controlling the overall vegetation complex of the site. Uh, fuel is, is in all of these, but now it's, it, the fuel is, is actually captured by the vegetation complex. And we have a third leg here as ignitions, but now this is operating over decades to centuries uh, and over spatial scales of, of you know, hundreds of miles, square miles to, uh, well, dozens to hundreds of square miles. So uh, it's, you know, climate's more than just the average of the weather, but it's also the variation in, in uh, uh, how weather operates over, over these various time scales and, of course, then how it's going to affect both the vegetation complex at the site and the fire regime complex at the site. So we can start looking at the fire regimes, uh, you know, as, across something like the Front Range in Colorado here, where we've got going from short grass steppe on the eastern plains uh, through lower montane, upper montane, subalpine forests, all the way up to alpine tundra. As we go across there, obviously climate is changing. We're getting increasing moisture, decreasing temperature. At the same time, that change in climate the pyrogeography across that type of elevational gradient is also changing the fire regimes. Uh, fire regime being the average fire behavior, frequency, and size over some period of time that we're dealing with. Now this is at least in the forest zone along here, we get increasing fire severity typically and decreasing fire frequency as we go up in elevation. So this is the average of how fire is behaving and occurring across this type of elevational gradient. So we have a change from primarily surface fire through to active crown fire. We have a change also in fire frequency. Now one thing is in terms of, of looking at why this is the case, we have uh, on this axis over here, this is modified from a, um, a figure that Bob Martin put together years ago, but uh, from very hot dry conditions at lower elevations to very cold wet conditions as we go across the uh, uh, gradient of ecosystem types here, and we have from fairly low fire frequency to fairly high fire frequency in the, as we go up low to high and then back to low again. Well, one explanation for that is at lower elevations, we have lots of dry conditions plentiful, but down here productivity is lower. We have more open woodlands or forests if we do have forests. We've got uh, open uh, shrub or even desert ecosystems, and there's not enough typically fuel connectivity for fires to be very, to occur very often, uh, but the fuels dry out awfully. On the other hand, at the higher elevations, uh, very productive ecosystems in general, so we have lots of fuels, uh, continuous canopies, um, some places continuous surface fuels, but these are very much colder and wetter ecosystems, higher in the mountains and so on, and dry conditions really limit the fuel occurrence and spread. And then what we started to call the uh, middle elevation Goldilocks fuel effect. Everything's just right down here in the middle. There's, there are relatively productive ecosystems, uh, fairly continuous canopies in some places, certainly fairly continuous surface fuels, grass fuels, and they dry out fairly often. So we end up getting the most amount of fire across this type of a, a, a pyrogeographic geographic gradient of elevation. And just to show you, we do have some data that tend to show this. This is a study that Emily hired on Stan Kitchen and Mark Weber and I have, have recently completed. There's a GTR on this. It's going to be coming out. Uh, 19 sites that we sampled uh, uh, crossed elevational gradients in Utah and eastern Nevada in the Snake Range. Uh, but what we've got is on this is, uh, so the, the x-axis down here is number of fire years and basically it's an index of fire frequency across an elevational gradient, across a gradient in ecosystem type, and then a, a gradient, the third one, the bottom uh, panel is a uh, across a gradient in moisture. So from very dry to very wet, from lower elevation ecosystems to higher elevation ecosystems, and then across the elevation gradient. 
and you can see it in general uh, that U-shaped pattern. The highest elevate the highest fire frequencies are in the ponderosa pine in the mixed conifer zones, and in the middle of the moisture gradient, and in the middle of the elevational gradients. So across, again, this is the fire regime. These are these average characteristics. Uh, we have a similar graph that shows uh, the same thing for uh, fire severity as well. Now, the first project that I wanted to talk about is really, uh, it's, it's a, was funded by Joint Fire Science Program to put together basically a bibliographic database on uh, fire regime, uh, all information on fire regime uh, that was out there by uh, what they used were uh, the Bailey's ecoregion uh, approach to uh, classify and characterize then and synthesize everything we know about fire regime, uh, average fire, fire severity, so on, across this, uh, across different gradients around the western, uh, well, ex excuse me, around this entire U.S. And in fact, a lot of these ecosystems, of course, are across even North America as well. Now that's going to be out this fall, their final report and in the bibliographic database. Now they also have all of this online. The Fire History and Climate Change uh, Bibliographic Database is all online. And I'll, I'll uh, show this uh, URL again at the very end and um, uh, who to contact. Bill Summers is the main contact on that uh, from JM, uh, George Mason University in Virginia. But that's fire regime. So the concept of the fire regime really cons cons encompasses the average conditions, but what I want to talk about for the rest of the talk is really fire history, where we're looking at temporal variations uh, in fire regimes and fire occurrences and fire behavior through time, especially is that driven by climate change. So this is really where the fire Another area where fire climatology obviously is going to be very important and particularly thinking about going into the future. So first of all, and, and of course I, I can't show a, uh, I can't do a talk like this without showing a, some pictures of trees and some tree rings, uh, but what are our data sets that we're dealing with? They're mostly fire scars. So here's a picture of a cat face on a, on a ponderosa pine tree. And this one has about uh, 14 fire scars, each of these little ridges. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 fire scars across there. So uh, this is a snag. We can take a section out of that by using the cross dating in the tree rings. We can find out the absolute dates of each of these uh, fire injuries, these fire scars within the tree. We can tell even uh, information about the seasonality of the fire, when it occurred within the ring. So we can get lots of information about the fire regimes by looking at age structure in the stands. We can also look at, say, for example, fire severity. So we use these data then. We can start compiling networks of fire history sites, fire chronologies. So this is one that probably a lot of you have seen. Uh, the latest iteration of it, uh, Tom Swetnam and colleagues have collected around, uh, I think it's around 90, over 90 sites in southwest Arizona, New Mexico. Uh, this bottom graph down here, you can see from 1600 out to the present, and this is the number on the y-axis then, the histogram, are the numbers of sites recording fires across this large network. So what we see is that in certain years, there's lots and lots of sites recording fires. Uh, these are any, uh, the, the dates that are marked on there are any time we have uh, more than 20 sites recording fires out of, uh, anywhere across the southwest. Now, what we can start doing is looking at uh, independently derived uh, reconstructions of climate and see what the average climate conditions for these years was like. And that's what this upper left-hand figure is, is what's called a superposed epoch analysis, or SEA. And in this case, we're looking against Palmer Drought Severity Index, a uh, measure of soil moisture. And the zero year here on the uh, x-axis in the SEA graph is the average climate conditions for all of these fire years. Anytime we've got more than 20 sites recording fire, 
around Arizona and New Mexico in the past, going back to 1600. Uh, obviously, low PDSI means drought. And these bars right here, uh, the lines represent 99, 95, and 99, 90%, no, 95, 99, and 99.9% .9 confidence intervals based upon uh, statistical uh, analysis. So essentially, these were drought years. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. Well, one thing that we're seeing in, uh, particularly in the Southwest, where uh, these are all ponderosa pine ecosystems, where uh, productivity is also critically important. Again, coming back to this balance between fuel amount and fuel drying, we also have quite often we see uh, prior years, prior to the average of these fire years, lag two to three years, one to three years, uh, wet years. This is the fuel buildup. So these are mainly grass and herbaceous fuels, fine fuel fires. So you build up the fine fuels here, you get a good drying on the fire year, and then that's when you're going to have a fairly extensive fire. Now we can start looking across, uh, so that's just the southwest. Now let's start looking across larger landscapes. So here we go from southern New Mexico, the Sacramento Mountains, northern New Mexico, the Jemez, uh, up through the Front Range uh, into the Black Hills. A couple of things. Now, each of these is now, each of these lines going back to 1400 and out to the present, each of these lines is a single chronology and then dates of fire scars, so uh, multiple trees that go into each one of these lines. And then any fire date uh, that's recorded on at least two trees in that site, and all of these sites are anywhere from uh, uh, any, say 15 acres, 20 acres, up to about 100 acres or so, or even larger, 200 acres. Um, now, first of all, a couple things. There, there, you can see elevational gradients in here. As we go to the lower forest border, there's higher fire frequency in any one of the mountain ranges. As we go up in elevation, we start uh, fire frequency tends to decrease. Uh, also, there's a latitudinal gradient, again, coming back to the pyrogeography across the, the western U.S. Uh, pretty much the same longitude, but as we go up in latitude from southern New Mexico to the Black Hills in South Dakota, uh, much more frequent fire in the southwest, so in the Sacramento's anywhere from about every three uh, to five years up to around every 15 to 20 years. Whereas when we get to the Black Hills at the lower forest border, right on the, the mixed grass prairie ecotone in there, uh, from about every 10 to 12 years to around 30 to even 40 years as we go up into the very wet portions of the mountains. So there's both elevational and latitudinal gradients in here. But the big thing, of course, is to look at the 20th century. So not only do we have climate controlling uh, fire occurrence, but obviously humans. And this is, of course, the story I'm sure most everybody's aware of. Um, it, last fires typically are in the late 1800s with uh, the uh, advent of Euro-American settlement and grazing. And then, of course, later in the 20th century, active fire suppression by land managers. Now, one quick thing, too, is we can, again, start looking at these SEAs. And, and we're doing this in the FACTS project, the Fire and Climate Synthesis where we're starting to look across uh, landscapes and look at these, these, for example, wet-dry relationships. So, for example, these are the 20 largest, 20 most common fire years in both the Black Hills and in the Southwest in this SEA. So, again, looking at the zero year are the average conditions. Uh, and this is all Palmer Drought Severity Index for the, uh, for the, uh, the fire years and then the lag conditions. So what we see is that drought, droughts drive fires in both areas, but the antecedent wet conditions are critical for fine build buildup only in the southwest, but not in the Black Hills. Longer intervals between fires in the Black Hills is what I think it is, and that typically then there's more time, plus perhaps more productive forests in general, there's more time for that fine fuel buildup to occur that all the Black Hills needed in the past for fires to occur was good drought conditions. Southwest, you had to have that combination of fairly wet conditions plus then the drought conditions. You know, you had to have the fuel build up. And again, these are the more extensive fires, the ones that are really burning across fairly large landscapes. 
Going back even further in time, this is work that Tom Swetnam has done in uh, Giant Sequoia, uh, and this is in the Giant Forest in the middle of uh, uh, the Sequoia Kings Canyon National Park. But if we look at fire frequency and going back through time relative to both the reconstruction of Palmer Drought Severity Index in this top panel, the fire frequency in red, PDSI in black, and then in that lower panel is the fire frequency again, the same line as in that top panel, but now plotted against temperature. What we see is these longer term variations related to, to longer term patterns in climate, millennial scale, multi-centennial types of scales in climate. So higher fire frequency coupled with both droughtier conditions, uh, oh, and by the way, uh, PDSI is reversed here, so wet is on the bottom, dry is on the top. So droughtier conditions in the PDSI and hotter temperatures during the so-called medieval warm period or medieval climatic anomaly uh, from about 800 AD to around 1300 AD or so, 1400. And then less fire as we go into the uh, so-called little ice age from around 1600 to around 1850 or so. Now notice the fire frequency just like in the southwest uh, drops off in the 20th century, uh, starting in the late 1800s and into the 20th century. So again, this is that human signal that's overriding the climate signal. Now I wanted to briefly put in a plug here for the International Multi-Proxy Paleo Fire Database. It's quite the uh, mouthful there, but uh, this is, uh, and, and on the left you see the fire distribution of fire scar chronologies right in the western U.S., or western North America, uh, lots in Mexico and a number in Canada, uh, southwestern Canada as well. Um, this, the database, the IMPD, contains both tree ring uh, fire scar data as well as sediment-based charcoal data. Uh, it's uh, all online. It's completely available. Uh, we have been working on a decision support tool for managers that uh, you can go to the IMPD, uh, download any data that are in your area, uh, management area, and look at both uh, fire frequency. At least most of these, of course, are based upon fire scar chronologies as well. Some uh, have age structure data. But in general, this is uh, really looking at more of the surface fire regimes, the lower elevation ponderosa mixed conifer, lower mixed conifer types of regimes rather than the higher elevation. But it uh, will give you some information about fire frequency for those ecosystems, uh, last fire dates, uh, and uh, too we're working on as, as well getting some, uh, uh, eventually all of the facts data will be tied in as well to uh, the IMPD. Uh, I just wanted to point out a recent paper that came out as well in Frontiers in Ecology and the Environment uh, that Don Falk was the lead author on that uh, also described a bit more on the IMPD if you'd like some more information. Now coming back to the Southwest, the other thing I'd like to talk about right now is uh, I've thrown in another graph up here at the top using the same data sets. Now we're looking at uh, the uh, an index of ENSO, the El Nino Southern Oscillation, the Nino 3 index. Uh, again, looking at Nino 3 here, uh, uh, Nino 3 is sea surface temperatures for the Central Pacific, but it's an index of the El Nino Southern Oscillation, and ENSO uh, forms what's called a teleconnection, uh, meaning that even though it occurs, it's a coupled oceanic atmospheric uh, feature of the central Pacific, the equatorial Pacific, uh, but it causes lots and lots of downstream effects in terms of droughts and wet periods and rainfall and so on. And it has an effect on fires because, of course, it's affecting the drought, the drought years and the wet years. So notice in this case, uh, in this upper panel here, the zero year now is again low, meaning La Nina. Uh, in terms of the Nino 3 index, uh, La Ninas are negative and El Ninos are positive. So in this case, what we see is that the fire years were predominantly La Nina years. And the wet years, the antecedent years, were predominantly El Nino years. So again, this whole, uh, not only are, are we starting to understand better uh, how fires relate to droughts and pluvials and fuel buildup, fuel drying, 
but also uh, how these are related to uh, these broader scale and, and global types of uh, systems. Now, one thing about El Nino being a global climate teleconnection, it's an oscillation. That's where the O is, and it tends to be somewhat predictable into the future. Now, just a real quick uh, lesson on on Enso here. Uh, but basically, what's going on? So, on the on the right hand side, here's the Pacific Basin, and across the equator, then we have the trade winds that tend to push a warm pool of water into the Western Pacific. Uh, it's the predominant flow, both oceanic and atmospheric, is from east to west. And so we have the, the warmer pool, these, these different colors here represent uh, anomalies in water temperature, basically. So under normal conditions, we have uh, some convective circulation. The predominant moisture is over the uh, Indonesia and southeastern Asia. Uh, we do get some over in North America as well. Now, under El Nino conditions, what happens is that the trade winds abate, the oceanic flow abates to a certain extent, and that pool of warm water is able to essentially slosh back across the Pacific Ocean. And we start getting a lot more warm water in the central Pacific. The, uh, of course, that warm water is, is, is evaporating and uh, going up into the atmosphere, causing rain. And then that rain is falling both uh, much more to, to North America rather than into Indonesia. So during El Nino's, North America, uh, at least our area of North America, tends to be wet. South America tends to be wet as well. Australia and New Zealand, uh, or Australia and Indonesia tend to be drier during El, El Nino conditions. During La Nina, then the trade winds strengthen and push more of the warm water further to the east, uh, causing dry conditions over North America, we get high pressure, uh, that down area over North America is in high pressure, uh, and much more moisture in, in the uh, Western Pacific. So again, these, these broad scale patterns, it takes some time for the La Nina conditions or the El Nino conditions to develop. That offers some predictive power to understanding, again, these, these boundary conditions in the climatology of North America. And certainly lots and lots of, of effort has been play, you know, it focused on, on that. Now, not only El Nino as a, as a um, and I don't want to go into this too strongly, but just uh, not only is El Nino, in terms of the fire climatology across the western U.S., not only is El Nino one of the drivers, but also uh, what we people have been finding recently is the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. This is a feature of the North Pacific Ocean. Uh, and North Pacific sea surface temperatures and pressure patterns as well. But that also uh, provides a climate teleconnection. So we have both ENSO and PDO. Now one thing in this figure to the upper left here is notice that there's, um, in terms of, of correlations between uh, the, uh, this is a, a 238 site fire scar network that we uh, put together a few years ago using the IMPD data. Um, and then correlated that against a gridded PDSI network, uh, Palmer Drought Severity Index across the western U.S. And one thing that we see strongly is sort of a dipole uh, area, what's been called a dipole, in terms of that when the southwest is dry and lots of fires occurring here, the Pacific Northwest tends to be wet and not as many fires occurring. Uh, the PDO also tends to uh, contribute to this and uh, gets this dipole. The, the Pacific Northwest tends to be a lot wetter during the PDO, uh, during warm period, warm phase PDO. Now, even more interesting uh, than, than that is uh, in this one paper, we also found a relationship between uh, the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation and fires across the West. Coast. Now, let me walk you through this uh, figure a little bit, but basically, so here's the time scale going back to, to the 1500s back here. Now, the blue line is the AMO index, uh, and the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation is uh, the sea surface temperatures, average sea surface temperatures for the North Atlantic uh, up to, from uh, the equator up to 70 degrees north. Uh, so that's what that is, and it's just smoothed right here. So that's sea surface temperatures for the North Atlantic. 
it tends to go through these multi-decadal phases and these blue and red bars represent periods when it's significantly warm or significantly cool AMO. Now AMO is one that everybody's looking at as well for hurricane effects and, and, and global climate change and all sorts of other things, but um, that uh, hurricanes tend to be stronger or more numerous when the AMO is in the warm, warm phase. Now the black line is the overall synchrony of all of the fires scar records that we compiled for the western U.S. Uh, meaning that are they are we getting lots of fires in both the southwest and the Pacific Northwest? Uh, are we getting lots of fires in Mexico, uh, Black Hills, and so on. So when fire synchrony is high around the western U.S., the black line, the correlation among all of the sites is high here as well. And one thing you can see is that there seems to be a pretty good correspondence between both the AMO and the uh, uh, synchrony index that we have across the western U.S. So um, anyway, and why this is, no one quite knows. I put in there this relationship is likely related to presence and strength of the uh, summertime subtropical moisture flow, but uh, so the summer monsoons, the strength of the presence of the and, and position of the summer monsoons, but that still needs to be explored a lot more strongly. But again, the, the idea is that with these climate teleconnections, we have this potential to have some predictive capacity, a predictive power of because uh, because again, these these tend to these oscillations tend to occur. They're not true oscillations; they're quasi oscillations. Uh, and you can see there's a lot of variation in that AMO index there, the blue line, but but uh, they tend to remain in fairly stable states for some period of time uh, before switching into alternative states. And if there is this relationship with fire, then we may be able to say in the future that fire, fire occurrences, fire frequency may be doing this as well. Uh, and there was, a, just to point out, there's a, a, a the other issue is that there's a, contingencies that are built up with these uh, when there's phase combinations. So for example, here, uh, this was a paper that was published in 2004, Greg McCabe, uh, looking at just combinations of when you get, uh, whether PDO is in the, in the cool phase or the warm phase, and then whether AMO is in the cool phase or the warm phase. Now look at this one where, where we've got cool PDO, uh, warm AMO, again, you can kind of see that dipole there in the Pacific Northwest and the Southwest, but essentially this is when you get lots and this is a, a, a correlation with drought. So uh, here we get to the cool PDO warm AMO equals to a lot of drought uh, going up into the Black Hills, uh, certainly down through the Central Rockies and then all over the Southwest and into to Texas. Uh, well just to point out where we are right now, the AMO is, is in a, has been in a warm phase, and the PDO is entering a cool phase. Also, just to throw things you know even more complicated, right now we're uh, there's a, a strong La Nina that's been developing uh, in the Pacific, in the Equatorial Pacific as well. So again, remember La Nina in the Southwest at least is going to uh, usually equals to dry, dry condition. So a few other studies that have been done looking at AMO, PDO, and La Nina, the, the phase combinations of these three teleconnections suggest that when you have warm AMO, cool PDO, and La Nina, that's when we get lots and lots of fires in the southwest. So uh, not gonna, I'm not going to predict anything here, but uh, just to, just to, just to keep that in mind for coming fire season, for the next year's fire season. Now, one thing about facts, just to just to go back to that point, is that uh, uh, one of our co-PIs on this project is Tim Brown with Desert Research Institute, and and you know we are hoping to have um, products that will be useful for predictive services, for like the NIFC predictive services. So um, um, anyway, uh, we can talk. I I can mention a little bit more about that at the very end here. Um, now, a couple. Of, the, the, our, our increased understanding of fire and uh, these oscillations, these global teleconnections, with the fact that we're conducting this gigantic global 
unreplicated, uncontrolled experiment in temperature by pumping more CO2 into the atmosphere. So we have up in the right-hand corner of the global land earth, ocean temperature changes, obviously, I mean, everybody's, and then just, I just picked out a few papers here that uh, where people are really starting to look at not only uh, potential linkages between global climate change and fire, but also other factors, uh, heat-induced tree mortality, bark beetles, obviously, certainly drought stress related to pine beet mortality and bark beetles. Uh, we've got, you know, fires, the, the least of our issues in some places right now in the, in the western U.S., in particular, in western Canada in particular. This was a, the Tony Westerling paper that came out. I'm sure probably a lot of you have seen this one, but where uh, in the top graph there, western U.S. wildfires and spring-summer temperatures, um, the red bars are the uh, large fires, class uh, F and G fires in the western U.S. related to temperature. And you can see a fairly good switch around 1985. We're starting to get a lot more large fires. Uh, that's related also to earlier snow melt in terms of uh, the uh, uh, days of anomaly from uh, uh, average conditions uh, in the middle graph there. And then the one I think that uh, the fire managers probably uh, should pay most attention to is longer fire seasons. So on the y-axis here on this lower graph is the day of the year, 0 to 365. Uh, the bottom of the red bar is date of first discovery uh, for that particular year. The, the top of the red bar is date of last discovery, and then the black bar is date of last control. Uh, notice how fire season length has changed quite considerably uh, over the last few decades. And uh, this paper was published in 2006. The data comes up to 2005. So um, it will be interesting to continue this as well. So in terms of fire management uh, and fire climatology, uh, obviously the uh, warming temperatures, increased drought, all of these are going to have uh, an effect. And then just this paper that just came out uh, very recently, August, um, in terms of, of how not only are, is it going to be affecting potentially fire occurrence, but then also fire regimes. So again, coming back to the very start where I showed the three triangles, the fire behavior triangle, the fire, fire triangle, and then the fire regime triangle, if we start changing the climate too much, it's going to have an effect on the fire regime, and both then are going to be changing vegetation as well. And this one, what they looked at was just uh, using a downscaled global climate change model, the GCM uh, model, they used three different models, but they essentially calculated fire rotations across the greater Yellowstone ecosystem um, for four 30-year periods here. So uh, um, where we've been and potentially where we're going in 100 years or so. So notice that the fire rotation uh, changes from, from greater than 120 years to less than 30 years or so uh, into, the, into the end of the century. Now, obviously, there's a lot of assumptions that are being built into these, but if we're going to be changing uh, that kind of, of potential for fire in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, obviously, they were going to be changing the ability of the current forest types and the vegetation that's there, the ecosystems that are there, and the wildlife habitat that's there uh, into something new. And just the last few slides here, but uh, just, you know, uh, this was a photo that Craig Allen sent to me after the Los Conchas fire that just burned in August, uh, or June and July, I guess, this year near in the Jemez Mountains. Uh, but obviously, if we're starting to have these kinds of effects on woodlands, uh, forests, uh, we're going to get type shifts. And we're seeing that already uh, from fires that occurred 10, 20, 30 years ago where uh, the vegetation that was there can no longer, particularly at the lower forest border, the vegetation, you know, if we had woody plants, they won't be able to come back after, uh, after something like this, probably. Uh, so as managers, one thing is, I, I, you know, in one of my soapboxes, personally, I think we should, uh, 
we, you know, we need to really get into some of these ecosystems and start thinking about what's coming next. Obviously, I mean, everybody is, but, but um, how we manage, you know, we don't manage for a, for a pinyon juniper woodland at this location probably anymore. It's not going to be a pinyon juniper woodland in our lifetime. So let's manage for the grassland, take care of the invasives, and so on. And then finally, just a, a quick couple of points about uh, uh, weather versus climate. And I just thought I'd throw this in uh, with the Texas fires that are occurring. Uh, this is the drought monitor that's updated uh, every week. Um, uh, look at the nice bullseye of drought, severe drought, exceptional drought that's sitting over Texas and Oklahoma. Uh, certainly, we're seeing some huge wildfires, as everybody's been reading uh, that. Probably some of you have been out fighting some of those. And I'd just like to throw this out. This was uh, the, compiled by the Texas State Climatologist. I just saw this on a blog recently, but I, a graph of June-August average temperature for Texas going back to 1900, I believe, and then total rainfall. So as you know, they're related in terms of as, you know, rainfall decreases, temperature goes up, and as rainfall increases, temperature goes down, which you can imagine. Uh, notice, first of all, that a lot of the 20th century is above the line here. Uh, I mean, the 21st century, excuse me, is above the line, so 2009, 2006. 2004 is, is right on the line, but uh, um, close to it. Uh, and then here's 2011. Spot the outlier, the uh, uh, title of that was. So certainly we've, something exceptional has happened in 2011. Now obviously, and, and this is something everybody argues about, we cannot write this down to global climate change. It may just be an outlier, uh, which brings me to my final point. Climate is what you expect, but weather is what you get. So. Uh, we're, we are looking at climate. Uh, we'll never be able to predict the climate with any great uh, complete accuracy simply because we, we are dealing with weather. We're dealing with, with these nonlinear and chaotic dynamics that go on in the weather system. Uh, but what we can do is be able to look at uh, uh, changes in terms of, uh, so for example, we may get increase in the mean. We, so in this case, we have a, uh, our current climate or previous climate uh, under global climate change. We may get an increase in the mean. We may also get an increase in the variance, which is one thing. Uh, your amount of total annual precipitation may not change at all, but a lot more of it may come in the summertime. How is that going to affect your fire occurrence if you're not getting the uh, if you're getting less wintertime precipitation? Another thing, too, obviously, in terms of temperature is, and, and this comes back to that uh, graph, uh, the Westerling et al. 2006 paper with the increase in the um, uh, fire season length is, uh, you know, we're getting earlier snow melt. We're getting uh, later snows. And, and both of those are going to just equal to more uh, longer fire seasons, longer season when fuels are primed to be able to burn. And then, of course, what we you know, may get probably is going to be both an increase and an increase in variance, increase in mean and an increase in variance. And all of that's going to just uh, equal to more record hot weather, such as 2011. Now, coming back, just these are my last two slides, but just uh, in terms of the project, the FACTS project, Fire and Climate Synthesis, uh, what we're trying to do is, is produce a series of, of fact sheets as well as new science to really look at fire climatology across the western U.S. based upon, uh, so expanding essentially that study that I showed you, looking at the PDO, the AMO, uh, looking at uh, superposed ecoac analyses, looking at even things like seasonality. Again, I, I haven't mentioned it very much, but we even can look at the season of fire occurrence based upon our, our uh, and we have all of that, those, all of those data are available in the IMPD data sets. Uh, these will be published, these two pagers uh, describing major themes in fire climatology uh, will be published through the Rocky Mountain Research Station. And then finally, my last slide, but just for further information, uh, and I'll leave this one up to, to end on, but uh, the Fire History and Climate Change website, 
Uh, again, contact Bill Summers at George Mason University and then the COPIs. These are both the uh, JFSP funded projects. Uh, COPIs are Sue Conard and Stan Koloff. Again, that one's focusing mainly on fire regime and then our project, the fire and climate synthesis, is focusing mainly on fire history. So again, these how climate has driven fire through time. Uh, right now we don't have our website up, but we'll eventually be housed at the Climate Change Resource Center. By the way, if uh, I just put in a little plug there for the CCRC, if you've not seen that, but there's a lot of really, really good information in terms of climate change and, and uh, ecosystem management uh, uh, in there. Um, uh, my contact information at Rocky Mountain Tree Research, and then also Elaine Sutherland is the other uh, person who's been very much involved in this project. And then our co-PIs, I, I mentioned there, Tom Swetnam, Don Falk, Tom Keatsberger, Tim Brown, and Crystal Colden. Uh, uh, certainly, you know, all of these, uh, Don and Tom and Tom, Thomas are working on the uh, fire science end of this project in terms of actually developing much more uh, detailed pyro pyrogeographic maps of, of ENSO effects, PDO effects around the Western US. So those will be coming out hopefully in the next year or so. And I'd uh, especially like to thank Josh and the uh, Lessons Learned Center and the IAWF for hosting the webinar. So thank you. All right, Peter. Well, thank you. That was really interesting. That was a there was a lot of ground to cover there, and that was um, some interesting information. I look forward to when some of that, those publications are coming out as well. Um, we'll go ahead and move into the questions, and there's a couple in, but go ahead, and if you're, uh, if, you're, if you're wanting to know how to send in a question, just type it into the questions box there, and then we'll read them out loud, and, and then Peter can respond. Um, the first question, and then I apologize in advance, I'm probably going to screw up the name. Kathleen Stoof, I believe, and she says, I just moved from Europe to the, United States, to the U.S. Northeast and I'm amazed by the fuel loads here. I understand that it's too humid, in here, too humid here in summer for large fires, but do you have an idea what climate change means in terms of fire risk in the northeastern U.S.? Uh, our project, yeah, and that's an interesting question in terms of, of uh, uh, no, I short answer, no. <laughs> Um, and I'm not sure who's actually working on that kind of question uh, for the Northeast, so I hate to say I don't. So. Okay. Well, we'll um, if uh, tell you what, I'll look into it and I'll see if I can send you some information on that, Kathleen. After okay. the after the webinar. Um, next question is from Charlie Posse. He says, "Hey, Pete, how's your hand? Mine's much better." <laughs> <First time. laughs> um, and then he writes a short. Short-term budget drives everything. Can we sell Congress to fund in the long run based on predictions? That's a good question, Charlie. Uh, and by the way, my hand's feeling much better. Thank you. Um, yeah, we're, you know, one of the, the issues, and, and I mean, you know, us, us tree ringers always, I like to point this out, is that the problem with humans is we have such short attention spans on everything. And it seems like that, uh, you know, particularly thinking about how climate is affecting uh, ecosystems and, and particularly future climate change, uh, where we'd be going and so on, uh, you know, w we certainly need to get out there and do a lot more uh, fuels treatment. We need to do a lot more restoration projects and so on. And obviously those are, are pretty difficult to get anybody to think about how to, <laughs> they're, they're not, immediate, whereas when you get a fire that's going to burn everything to the ground, obviously there's, there's plenty of money for working on that, although we're having this discussion in Congress right now about funding emergency uh, disaster relief. Um, so yeah, I, I don't have any answer to that, Charlie. I don't, uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> the next question is from Pat. Um, McKelvey, how is this issue being made a, a part of the decision discussions on the prescribed fire and managed fire policies of the near future? Are we willing to manage more given the possibility of large fire growth control issues from that and the longer season to deal with it? Um, um, 
that's actually one of the components. Uh, thanks for that question. Yeah, that's actually one of the components of the fire and climate synthesis. Uh, one of our, our um, one of the fact sheets that we're working on is is a, a concerned with how to to better incorporate uh, climate information and climate change information in particular, but 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 pyrogeographic information in general. Uh, into larger issues about, uh, you know, funding and, and use of prescribed fire and, and restoration efforts and so on and so on. So, um, you know, right now we don't have the, 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 but I think a big part of it is just education. So we need to, um, um, we need to just expand the, the understanding, uh, it seems to me, of, um, you know, how fire and climate have interacted and fire and climate and, and bark beetles for that matter have interacted over time and and certainly you know models play a big role in that that downscaled uh, GCM uh, work that uh, um, you know if, if, if it's true that we're going to start uh, you know decreasing the fire rotation period in Yellowstone and and uh, you know, Yellowstone burned in the 88, but maybe it's going to burn next time in much shorter interval, and and the lodgepole pine's not going to be able to come back. It's going to turn into something else. Um, you know, people need to to be aware of that and and uh, try and understand where uh, where it could potentially go into the future. Okay. Uh, the next question is from Zachary Prusak. He says, how can research like this be replicated in more frequent fire ecosystems like we have here in the southeastern U.S.? Yeah, hi, Zach. Um, yeah, that's a question um, that's actually there's some work already under uh, going on in terms of, of developing the fire chronologies from the tree ring data. Uh, 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 oh, Henry Grissino Meyer at University of Tennessee and uh, some others, uh, Texas have been doing quite a bit of work in the southeast uh, developing the tree ring chronologies. Obviously, too, then there's the fire atlas information that should be looked at as well. Uh, and in terms of, of um, you know, really trying to understand, the, the again, the pyrogeography. Now, uh, that's in terms of the fire and climate synthesis project. We're only focused ours on the western, in western North America, because that's where we've got these really good data sets, the pyro data sets. Uh, the paleo pyro data sets as well as modern fire history data sets. Uh, now the fire history and climate change obviously in terms of, of uh, you know fire regime changes I think uh, certainly a lot of their information that they've been compiling could be used in like for example downscale GCM results or something like that that uh, uh, could uh, you know would have a lot more application around uh, all over so. Okay. Um, the next question is from Gwyn Garcelon. I'm coordinating a public education campaign around changes in forest management in the White River National Forest. Uh, that's here in Colorado. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you think the public should know about these trends? That's a good question. Um, again, I think that the, the, you know, and it's it's coupled with all of these other uh, factors that's going on. I mean, like right now, I know the White River is the, the, not so much fire that's been the big uh, upset in the last few years, but the bark beetles, mountain pine beetle, has really been having an effect on the western slope in Colorado and in, in throughout the central and northern Rockies. Um, one issue, I think, is that, that uh, to my mind is we just need to educate the public a lot more about climate change. Um, that it's happening, it's going to get worse, it's going to have profound impacts on our ecosystems uh, and on our human systems, our societies. So I think that that's a, a big uh, component of it. Um, more specifically, uh, you know, one of the, the factors that we get asked all the time with this project that we're working with the FACTS project is uh, you know, how is future climate gonna change going to impact my district or my polygon that I'm interested in? And uh, I don't think, to my mind, we have, I mean, there was that study, again, I pointed out for uh, Yellowstone, 
but I'm not sure that we've got the understanding of the specific changes in certain areas to be able to really uh, uh, strongly focus on on specific areas. But so more in in terms of general uh, patterns rather than um, general patterns rather than specific patterns at lo at local areas. But you know. The more the public's aware of the fact that it's changing and it's going to have, you know, all of those dead trees out there are potentially because of us pumping CO2 into the atmosphere, the more I think that they can, can link those two together, uh, the better and, and more impact that's going to have on, uh, on the policymakers in Washington. Okay. Um, the next question is from Larry Nixon. And he asks, is anyone giving thought to the effect the Arctic Ocean will have since it's becoming ice-free? I think so. I mean, you know, I'm, I, uh, there's certainly a lot of uh, effort in terms of understanding global climate from these GCMs, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm positive that they've included ar ice-free Arctics into some of those uh, uh, models, uh, into those models. So, you know, uh, one thing is that it's not going to, raise the ocean level very much, uh, but if we start melting Greenland ice sheets down, then that will. So, uh, but uh, yeah, I think people are definitely looking into that, so. Okay. Next question is from Jeff Hurd. Uh, with the drought in Texas, are we looking at these same patterns moving to the southwest? If so, how can we possibly use prescribed fire to reduce large fire probability? Uh, that's a good question too. Um, you know, again, right now the big thing I think is in terms of just knowing uh, the uh, climatology and these teleconnections. Uh, La Nina is developing for this winter, uh, meaning that, that you know it could be a dry winter over much of the Southwest. If that's the case, then you know potentially next year could be a, a, a scorcher again. Uh, certainly, this year we had that that dipole pattern very very strongly set up. I mean, you know, Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas and Southwest certainly had its share, and and not just in the U.S. but uh, in northern Mexico as well. There were lots of huge fires, uh, very devastating fires. Obviously, the Wallow Fire, the biggest fire in in uh, Arizona in its history. Uh, whereas the south, where there's the Northwest was was very wet. You know, we had 200 and 60% snowpack here in central Colorado. Um, I'm not the climatologist, so I don't know exactly how to answer that question that, that, you know, if it's moving into the southwest. Now, in terms of the possibility to use prescribed fire to reduce large fire probability, I think, you know, the more effort that can be put into heading, you know, fuels management, fuels treatment, the better. However, at the same time, I mean, I'm involved in the Front Range uh, Collaborative Forest Landscape Restoration Program, and I mean, you know, I hate to say it, but it's drops in the bucket. We're talking about, you know, 30,000 acres of, over the next 10 years it's going to be treated uh, when we're, you know, really dealing with 800,000 or a million acres on the Front Range that need to be treated. Um, you know, right now we're doing it in you know, wooey areas. We're doing it uh, in natural areas where there's some, uh, you know, values at risk that we can identify. Uh, obviously, I think the more we can do, the better. But um, um, you know, I, I hate to say it, but I just keep thinking we need to get in there and make sure that at least if some place does burn and is you know, 700,000 acres burns in the Wallow Fire, 150,000 acres in the in the um, oh um, anyway that th that we can get in there and make sure that we're we are actually uh, using that as a fuel treatment, I guess, and making sure that there's um, some recognition that that now we've got a, an area that, that could be managed for 
uh, the best, you know, making sure that we get in there and do some prescribed fire in those areas in 10 years or 15 years or 20 years when there's been a, you know, if these, these areas burned historically on that kind of a, a rotation. Okay. Um, the next question comes from Brad Hawks, and he asks, if there's been an increase in fuel loads in the western U.S. mid-elevation forest, how has this been reflected in the role of previous wet fire seasons needed for drought years to produce large wildfires? Let's see. So in the mid-elevation uh, forest, in terms of like the Ponderosa uh, or, um, yeah, right now that's an interesting question because maybe that, uh, that wet-dry combination isn't uh, critical anymore. Uh, one other thing, though, too, is is think you know that that is the understory. So in the past, and I kind of skipped over that slide, but you know one uh, issue I think is that um, I I really hate the term mix severity fires because there's no uh, there's no scale associated with that. And one of you know we've been talking about fire frequency. I've been talking about fire frequency mostly, um, but there was also a, a you know, large range of variation in terms of fire behavior. And one of the heuristics I think is, is useful in this is to think about surface fire versus passive crown fire versus active crown fire is the, sort of the three breakdowns rather than mixed severity versus crown fire. And um, uh, so, for example, that uh, um, the um, the passive fire, crown fire, meaning that, that fire spread across the landscape has to be through surface fuels. Well, now we've changed those. So that's where in the past the surface fuels would have really been important to build, you know, the wet years building up those surface fuels. Uh, but the um, today what's gone on is now we, because we've been putting out fires in that, those Ponderosa and mixed conifer forests for so long, uh, that we've got more continuous fuel, uh, aerial fuels, that active crown fire, it's, it's changed from passive to active crown fire. So we've sort of lost that whole need for the surface fuels to be built up. Now all we need is a good drought year, and maybe not even a good drought year. Maybe just a, any old drought year will do. Okay. Okay, so this is the last question. Uh, this comes from Kendrick Brown. Uh, from a landscape perspective, do fire scar treating records slowly become biased towards more fire since sampling likely targets those areas that burn. In other words, are there sampling projects in areas that have low fire frequencies? Yeah, that's a good question, Kendrick. I mean, you know, um, as with any paleoecological data set, we have what's called a fading record problem. As we go back further in time, we're dealing with fewer and fewer records. Um, certainly that's the case in more of the, uh, the low fire frequency uh, ecosystems, or the particularly the ones that burned, uh, the forested ecosystems at least, that burned in high, uh, high severity fires. Because, you know, the last high severity fire erases all of the previous evidence from that stand. So there we do have to turn to uh, other uh, methods, such as, as sediment uh, charcoal layers uh, found in, in lakes or bogs or wet sites and so on. And one thing is just to, to put in a plug for the IMPD is that there are charcoal records that are contained within the IMPD as well. And those go back, um, I didn't hit it, but in the, the slide on the IMPD, uh, you know, they, those go back hundreds to thousands of years, to even tens of thousands of years in some places. Um, obviously lower resolution than uh, in ter temporal resolution in terms of being able to date the fires to the actual year that they occurred and then to look at um, annual variation in climate. But certainly, uh, for example, coming back to that uh, medieval warm period versus little ice age pattern uh, in the giant sequoia that uh, Tom Swetnam uh, found in his work, um, certainly there we can see, a, a, you know, these longer term, multi-decadal, multi-centennial types of, of changes in fire regimes relative to those kinds of uh, changes in climate as well, and human activity as well. So, All right, Peter. Well, thank you very much. It's been a really interesting presentation, and um, I'm looking forward to when some of those publications from the research start to come out, um, and uh, we appreciate it.
Um, well, thank you, Josh. And, and one final thing is if anybody has any questions, please uh, feel free to, to drop me an email um, or give me a call. My, my website is rmtrr.org, so my uh, email is there, my phone number. And also, if, anyone, if you know of anyone that might want to view the webinar or a recording of the webinar, it should be posted pretty quickly here on the Advances in Fire Practice site. And there's a, a link there on your screen um, and uh, eventually on the Frames website as well. All right, well, thank you very much, Peter. Well, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And, uh, uh, yeah, talk to you later, Josh. Okay, thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye.